Bayview Spotlight. I'm Rachel Barenbaum, author of A Bend in the Stars. And today I am so, so excited about my guest. Zakia Dalila Harris is amazing. This is the second time I get to interview her. That's right. I already interviewed her for LA Review of Books. And she is so incredible that I am having her back here on Debut Spotlight. The other black girl just dropped. Tell me, Zakia, what is the book about? The Other Black Girl is about a young Black woman named Nella Rogers, who has been the only Black woman working at Wagner Bus Books for the last two years. Um, so she is really, really, really excited when another Black woman named Hazel is hired to work in the cubicle next to her. But, 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 there's always a but, right? Um, before Nella can get too comfortable um, with this other Black woman who she thinks will be an ally, very strange things start happening in the office and Nella begins to wonder if Hazel is all that she seems. So that's the, the main storyline, but then there are also the stories of three other Black women who are all also bound to the world of media in New York City. And they're also all bound by a secret that has implications for all of the Black women in the book and Black people all over the world. So I have to admit that I got an early copy of this book and I didn't read any descriptions or anything. I just dove in and I thought I knew what I was reading, right? And then all of a sudden I didn't. <laughs> and you just like yeah. twisted it in, right? All of a sudden it's a psychological thriller. That was amazing. Thank how did you. you. How did you do that? Like, you know, and, and what's been the reaction to that surprise? It's been the reaction's been all over the place, honestly. I mean, the, thankfully, and it could be just because my wonderful agent and editor and all of my team weed out everything, but people are here for it. I mean, I got this kind of idea for a mashup uh, because really that's me. I'm a mashup of, I love horror, I love thriller, sci-fi, but then I also, of course, I'm constantly thinking about race, my identity, how the space that I'm in affects who I am and how I behave. And so all of those things just felt, um, I won't say easy to put into this book, but I knew how they all kind of interacted with one another before I started writing it. So it was really fun to get to explore a slow burn and play with genre with this book. Amazing. So the other thing that really kept me reading was I thought I knew what it was about, but then really I kept thinking, this is actually about who should be speaking up, right? Yes. And how, yeah. how are yeah. they going to speak up? Can you talk about that? Totally, totally. Um, for sure. I mean, I worked in book publishing. I feel like it's no secret at this point. It's in the, in the copy. Um, and there's a dynamic, I think, when you're an assistant um, in a lot of different places, not just publishing, where you really are a secondary role. You're, you're really there to, you're, of course, secondary in the sense that, like, the power you have is not as important. Because I will say editorial assistants, oof, like, every possible part of the book process, we are there. Um, but in terms of, like, what is being published. Uh, you can't acquire things usually, typically, as an editorial assistant. So you're really kind of in this space and you have to navigate that. Um, and I think that looks different for everybody. I think it looks different for women a lot of times. And I think it especially looks different for young Black women. Um, and I know when I was in publishing, it's hard to get into that space. And you feel like the pressures are even higher because you want to you know, represent you have to represent, you feel like you have to represent all Black people all over the world when you're the only one. Um, and you want to make sure that other people also get in, other Black people, other people of color into publishing or any of those industries that you're in as well. So, so yeah, it's just a lot. <laughs> yeah, talk about pressure, right? Represent yeah. all Black people, like, oh my God. Um, which you really explain so well between Nella and Hazel, right? Because most people assume they are the two Black women in the office that they are a team, right? And they're mm -hmm. going to have the same opinions and say the same things, but they're not, right? right? They're not the same people and they represent totally different voices. So can you talk about that dynamic of people assuming they're a team when they're not? Yeah, yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. I mean, Nella also assumes that that's how it's gonna go, right? Um, which is really interesting too, because like on the one hand, it's like, why, are, why do you assume we're going to be best friends? But also Nella wants that, like her specific experience, she wants that. But of course, Hazel has other things kind of going on. I'll just say that. Um, and I wanted to look at that of how, I mean, when I first started writing this, I thought about Hazel, Nella, 
them and what their relationship would look like. That's really what set the book off for me um, in this white workspace. And then the more I wrote and looked into them and the story, it just evolved and I saw exactly why the relationship was the way it was, why the stakes are so high for them specifically, rather than if it were Nella and another, um, a white colleague who was working next to her. It's just different. Yeah, so I feel like we need to bring up sort of where they they come to, you know, fight a little bit is over this character of Chartricia. Yes. And in, uh, how about you describe Chartricia for us and what happened? Because you yes. did it so beautifully. <laughs> um, Chartricia is a Black character uh, created by a white author that um, Nella is working with. Um, he's a best-selling author, pretty big deal. Um, a lot of his stories are kind of taking hot button topics and in this case it is the opioid uh, crisis um, and kind of turning them into like I mean we've seen we've seen these kind of books before turning them into bestsellers and, and looking at the characters like affected by those topics and so um, he has been advised um, to include a little, throw a little color in there, I think is what I say. Um, and he does, and the result is for Nella, a caricature that just feels absolutely offensive, clearly not the right kind of representation. Um, and she has to grapple with whether or not she should speak up because this is the author who keeps the lights on at Wagner Books. Um, it's a little bit of a diva. So it's hard for her to navigate that. I just cringe every time I hear that, right? <laughs> Throw a little color in. Yeah, yeah. We're just all little paints, you know? <laughs> right, right. Like there's no real person behind it. I mean, yeah. oh my God. Yeah. Um, but this is where there's a lot of controversy and how they should speak out about it or if they should, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I love mm -hmm. that. And then that brings you up to one of my favorite quotes from the book um, goes something like, <laughs> what is worse to know and not do anything or to not know at all? Um, yeah. So what yeah. do you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was really, I was really channeling like the if a tree falls in a forest kind of thing when I was writing that. I really think it, I, it depends. I think that, I do think in today's day and age, there are so many resources and so many ways to be aware that we're not in existence 10 years, even five years ago. I think conversations around natural hair have changed, conversations about intersectionality, all of those things have changed. So I do feel like, I do think I come on the side of like, yeah, you, you, it's, you really should know. And it's, it's not, it, it's bad if you don't. What I ha one thing that I have to ask you about, and I think I've told you this before, that when I put the book down, right? My first question is why hair? <laughs> why black women's hair? I mean, it's yes. so loaded for all women, but why did you choose hair in particular for this book? Yeah, I mean, I knew, I knew from the get-go in terms of Nella and Hazel's relationship, I knew that hair would be the thing that when Nella saw Hazel, I mean, there are a lot of things she sees about Hazel. It's the, the beautiful clothes, the, the way she's able to carry herself, even though she's talking to this white woman in this new space that for Nella was really terrifying. But the thing that really like Nella locks in on and is like, we are the same in this way is natural hair because Hazel has dreadlocks and Nella has, she's growing a fro. And that for me was important because I know when I was coming up and growing up and I was mostly around white people, I really wanted to have straight hair for a lot of my life. And I did, I got started getting relaxers when I was 10 because I wanted to be like all my friends. And as I got a little older, you know, I finally got to meet other black people because again, growing up in mostly white spaces. And that was when I noticed like getting comments about you talk like a white girl, this kind of thing. And it pushed me in this weird direction because I was like, right. I mean, most of my friends are white, but also at the same time, like I've been raised so black. Like I, I listen to all this music. I know all of my history, all of these things. Like why, why is this, a, why is this something that for you keeps me from being black enough? Right. And so I think once I went through my own journey of accepting myself, accepting the way I talk, um, the music that I listen to, um, the friends, the company that I keep, 
Um, and then also once I decided in my early twenties, the big decision to cut my hair off, um, everything just kind of came into place for me. I felt really tied to my blackness, really tied also to black people. Um, but also I just felt, I felt good. I felt like I had finally, you know, accepted the part of me that for a while I'd been rejecting, but then I'm also still, you know, again, keeping, still listening to the same music, love Phil Collins, but also love Biggie. Like I, <laughs> sorry, doing it all. And I, I wanted that to really show through with Nella and Nella's insecurity of with her own blackness. And then how with Hazel, that's the thing that really for her, she thinks that'll be the thing that connects them um, and connects her to the diaspora. But eh. <laughs> I think that's the first time I've ever heard Phil Collins mentioned in my show. <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you. Shout out to Phil and yeah, Genesis. Shout out to Phil. <laughs> so the reception for this book has been unbelievable. I've seen it everywhere already, right? And you have book groups. Everyone is embracing this book. People of all colors from all parts of the U.S. and yeah. probably around the world soon. What do you want all of us to take away from this book? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I want readers to just take away another example of, of Blackness. Um, six examples, really, with all of the women in the book, but just another example that, you know, we we can be messy, we can say the wrong thing at the wrong time, but we're still worth completely engaging with, understanding our reasons, understanding why we treat one another the way we do with Nell and Hazel's complicated relationship and Kendra Ray and Diana's complicated uh, friendship, um, but also why we still don't feel like we can be ourselves all the time. Um, and I don't think everyone should be able to bring their whole selves to work, but I do feel Black women especially um, often find themselves feeling like they have to really really shave off parts of themselves to fit into this, this, this space. And so, my hope is that readers will also see that, just the nuances, the ways in which we code switch, all of those heavy decisions we were talking about before about like, do I speak up, do I not speak up? And how all of that really affects our experience moving through the world. And then I also just want readers to have fun. <laughs> they will, I'm sure they will. So I also am dying to ask you, what was the hardest part about getting this book published? Oh, oh, that's such a good question about getting it published. I mean, I have to say it moved unusually quickly for me, to be honest. Um, having worked on the other side, I went in fully prepared for every possible, you know, obstacle. And it moved pretty nicely, to be honest. But the thing that I think for me was hardest besides just getting a whole draft on the page um, was, hmm, I think being in the early part, that really interesting in-between part where I'd finished the book and I was querying agents and I was getting uh, notes back. And, you know, I think it's easy, it's easy to feel deterred um, and easy to feel swayed a little bit. And I did have, you know, some reception of saying, uh, publishing, we don't think publishing's ready for this yet. Um, I did get, yeah. Wow, I, you got that? I can't, I, oh my God. I did, I did. And I think about that note pretty often now. Wow. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm not gonna lie, I, I cried because I was in, I'm still in the early stages and I had gotten a few rejections that, you know, didn't say that, but then I was like, does everyone feel that way? And that kind of got to me and I was doubting myself and, you know, that, I wasn't gonna do anything rash. I wasn't gonna change the book from that, but I definitely like opening up my bubble, I think was the hardest part of the process because I also just had me in the book for, for months when I quit to, to write it. And so really being knowing and opening myself up to, to that kind of criticism um, was, was I think maybe one of the hardest things for me. Um, but then also I think, you know, the, the genre element too. Uh, I wanted to get that right because it's it's hard. It's so hard. And I didn't really set out to, I mean, I set out to write a book like this, but I hadn't like categorized it as a genre. I just knew it was me. And so making sure I went back and really, you know, imbued 
the parts of the book with that genre, that was pretty tricky as well. Uh, thank you to my agent and editor for <laughs> bearing with every single iteration and like, what if, what if, what if? Oh my God, I love it. So I have like a dozen more questions for you, but we're out of time. So I'm gonna ask you just one more because okay. my listeners always love this one, which is yeah. what advice do you have for new writers? Oh, you know, I think my advice actually, because I, did mention like getting that reception back uh, was pretty hard for me from from agents and just like moving through that process. Um, I would say open up your bubble early. Um, I think it's important to have friends uh, who you trust reading your work. Um, I did have that as well. I still it still actually honestly didn't fully prepare me for the uh, querying process, but I definitely think it helped. It helped getting reception on especially the first few pages because um, that's really an important part when you're trying to get anyone to buy a book or anyone to represent you um, is really making sure you get that beginning right. So share your work as early as you feel comfortable and make sure you give boundaries uh, with whatever you're comfortable with because every writer is different. I love it. Zakia, thank you so much. I love your book, thank The Other you. Black Girl. Thank you so many, many times. Thank you so much, Rachel.